Hello, I'm Nick Gowie. Welcome to the Emanuel Centre here in London for this Intelligence Square debate. The motion for this debate, it's time to bring Russia in from the cold. Rapprochement is in the West's best interests. Well, Russia under President Putin has become an assertive interventionist power around the world. Western sanctions followed Russia's intervention in Ukraine and also its seizure of Crimea in 2014 in violation of international law. Witness Moscow's military intervention supporting President Assad in Syria. Russian meddling in the US political process is now the focus of several inquiries in Washington. Well, that's the focus of our Intelligence Squared debate. We have an excellent panel for you, arguing for the motion Vladimir Pozner from Moscow, one of Russia's best-known television presenters and analysts. He was a former advocate of the Soviet Union. And Domatilis Sagramoso, who is leading expert on security in Russia at the Department of War Studies here in London at King's College. Arguing against the motion from Washington, D.C., Michael Hayden, former director for both the CIA and the National Security Agency and a retired U.S. Air Force four-star general. From Warsaw, Radek Sikorski, distinguished Polish politician until recently he served as first defense and then foreign minister. Please welcome all our speakers. Well, shortly you'll hear from the four panellists, two for the motion and two against. I'll then throw open the debate to the floor here in the Emanuel Centre. And the audience, you have been asked to vote uh, for the motion before the debate as you are coming in. Then there'll be a second vote towards the end of the debate. And you'll know how the arguments have swung, either for or against the motion. Now the opening statements from the panellists. Speaking first for the motion, Vladimir Pozner. Russian television presenter and author, raised in Paris and New York, he moved to the Soviet Union in 1952, where he became an advocate for the Soviet system during the Cold War. He now hosts a popular weekly interview show on Russian television. The first voice for the motion, Vladimir Pozner. Thank you. I propose to look at the motion we're debating from one simple and yet fundamental uh, viewpoint, that of national interests. I would ask, is it in the interests of the West to bring Russia in from the cold, to establish working relations, in fact to establish a web of ties involving Russia at all possible levels? Or on the contrary, would this run counter to the interests of the West? Well, it all depends on how you determine those interests. Allow me to call your attention to the fact that Russian society has from ancient times been divided into two camps, pro-Western and anti-Western, Russophile. The pendulum has swung back and forth, and generally speaking, the anti-Western forces have been the victors, supported very strongly by the Russian Orthodox Church, which was anti-Western and remains anti-Western. However, there was a rupture in that fabric, a rupture that lasted for nearly 80 years, I'm alluding, of course, to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which come this fall will be celebrated in Russia by some and damned by others. Celebrated by the anti-Western Russian nationalist and chauvinist forces and damned by those who dream of Russia's adhering to the values that have come to be defined by Western civilization. During those 80 odd years, all supporters of Western values those who were traditionally referred to as Zapadniki, or Westernites, were purely and simply wiped out. Some did escape. Most of the others were killed. Not all. Some were quiet and said what they were supposed to say, while in the privacy of their kitchen spoke in hushed voices about the dreams that would never come true. Never, because no one believed that one day things would change. But change they did and in the most incredible and dramatic way, 
Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, launched perestroika and glasnost, a restructuring of the system and a liberalization of the media, kicking off a process that would lead to the breakup of the Soviet Union, to the true independence of the so-called Soviet satellites, and also of all the former Soviet republics. Russians began to travel, see a world they'd been denied. This was a victory for the pro-Western forces, a victory of unparalleled magnitude. And many thought the battle had been won. And yes, the battle had been won, but not the war. Now then, what will happen should the policy of excluding, isolating Russia continue? It will, beyond the question of the doubt, play into the hands of the most hawkish and anti-Western forces in Russia who will be able to say, see, we told you so. We always said that America wants to weaken us, isolate us, destroy us. And it will be very hard, if not impossible, for those who support normal relations of Russia with the United States to find a plausible response to that. Should this trend continue, here's what will happen in Russia. The number of Russians studying abroad will be dramatically decreased and ultimately canceled. The number of Russians allowed to travel will be limited, as it was in Soviet times. Access to Western things such as movies, books, and media will be shut down. The internet will be controlled, as it is in China, or for that matter, to a certain extent in Ukraine, which strangely enough does not seem to bother the West. The absolutely free and highly diverse exchange of opinion that is typical of Russian social media today will be repressed. Freedom of speech, which does to a certain point exist today in Russia, will be curtailed. Russia will close in upon itself, bring down a much less porous iron curtain than before, thus becoming even less predictable. This will lead to a resumption of the hair-trigger relationship that typified the worst of the Cold War years. And now I ask, would this be in the national interests of the United States? I hold that it would not, and that conversely, a Russia integrated into the international community, a Russia not just brought in from the cold, but an included, not excluded Russia, is indeed in the national interests of the United States. And allow me to conclude by saying, this has nothing to do with being pro or anti-Russian. It has to do, to use an expression employed in a completely different area, it has to do with being pro-life. Thank you very much. Vladimir Posner, thank you very much. The first speaker for the motion. Now the first speaker against the motion from Washington, Michael Hayden, former director of the CIA and also the National Security Agency under Bill Clinton and also under George W. Bush. Michael Hayden, the floor is yours. Good evening, and let me tell you how delightful it is for me to be anywhere but Washington, D.C. <laughs> It's a wonderful motion. It's time to bring Russia in from the cold. And if we're voting on the last half of it, I would join Vladimir in saying that that's a good idea, because bringing Russia in from the cold would make it a better world. It's just not time. What, what, what even generates the question right now for all of us? What's new? What, what's different? What, what sharp turn in, in Russian policy have, have we witnessed that would suggest that we make a comparable term. And, and when we bring Russia in from the cold, what are we bringing them into? And here I would suggest it's into a community of like-minded, like-valued, like-purposed, like-governed nations. And Russia is not currently in that community, and it's not in that community by choice. Not our choice. Russian choice. What we have seen in Russia for the past decade plus has been accelerated corruption, the corruption of democracy, of free markets, of the rule of law, the growth of authoritarianism, the suppression of political competition, the end of an independent judiciary, and a serious threat to snuff out anything resembling an independent press. 
All of this in a desperate attempt to justify what is unarguably an autocracy. And that autocracy is digging deeply into the well of Russian history to justify itself, going back to re-identifying Moscow as the third Rome, as morally superior to, well, you and me, in a corrupt and decadent West. Russia has chosen a dark chapter of its past. It is not chosen what could still be a bright future. And the Russia of today has grasped on to real and perceived historic grievances of the Russian people and has created for its own purposes a view for that people of an outside world that is relentlessly hostile, relentlessly anti-Russian. Now the argument has been made that this is fundamentally our fault that, that Russia has been threatened by NATO expansion and European Union expansion eastward toward the Russian borders. The threat to today's Russia is not comprised of NATO arms. The threat to today's Russia is comprised of NATO ideals. NATO practically disarmed. It was never an offensive alliance and no reasonable military man in the Russian Federation today can picture NATO as being poised to threaten the Russian Federation. My army, which consistently, historically, has been the most powerful army within NATO. In the 15 years between 1997 and 2012, which is the period we're talking about here, went from 20 brigades on the continent of Europe to two, hardly, hardly a posture of threat to the Russian Federation. Bringing Russia in from the cold now, this Russia, really means concessions to this Russia. After all, this is our fault. This is our hostile policy that has created this serious rupture in relations. And so we're going to have to make concessions. We're going to have to self-correct if we're going to have a relationship with this Russia and allow them to join us. Otherwise, they will continue their self-imposed isolation. So we will have to halt NATO's Baltic deployment. We should end efforts to redress historic wrongs in the Ukraine, in Georgia, and Crimea. We will be required to falsely rehabilitate Russia as a real counterterrorism partner to Europe and the United States. And then finally, we will all have to embrace collective amnesia for what the Russian Federation has done for their incredible electoral intervention into American and European electoral processes. Thank you. Michael Hayden, thank you very much indeed. Now the second voice for the motion. Domitila Sekromoso, who is a top expert on conflict and security in Russia and Eurasia, and also on Russia's relations with NATO and the European Union. Lecturer in security and development at the Department of War Studies at King's College here in London. Domitila, the floor is yours. Why? Why is it good to bring in Russia from the cold? Because good and positive relations with Russia are indispensable for European security. Because at a time of heightened challenges such as terrorism, Brexit, massive migrations, climate change, we need Russia as our partner. Because contrary to what many might think, Russia is a part of Europe also because European security cannot be built at the expense of Russia. Because contrary to what is often said, the West did not single-handedly defeat Russia in the Cold War. Together with the West, this Russia, which was part of the USSR, brought an end to the Cold War without shedding any blood. And it was the Russia under President Yeltsin which withdrew all its troops from Eastern Europe and last but not least 
peacefully dismantled the USSR and thereafter engaged in a very tortuous, difficult road towards democracy, human rights, and a market economy. With a very difficult environment, with very limited resources, and with hardly a history of democracy to look back. But it showed that totalitarianism was not in the Russian DNA, and it is not in the Russian DNA today. At the time when the USSR collapsed, the West had an option to engage with Russia or isolate Russia. We continued to enlarge NATO, which is a military alliance very close to Russia's borders. We abandoned the ABM Treaty, which is a pillar of European and global security. We began slowly building strategic and defense missiles systems in Europe, not far from Russia's borders. We went all the way to promising NATO membership to countries such as Ukraine, with whom Russia had very close ties, both culturally, in human level, on the economic level, and historically, and also with Georgia, which is located along Russia's most sensitive borders in the North Caucasus. Imagine for a moment how the United States would feel if it faced an Islamist insurgency in Texas, the enlargement of a hostile alliance, not only in Central America and in Mexico, Mexico but potentially in Canada. That was a predicament that Russia faced. This is not a debate about Vladimir Putin and his actions, whether they're right or wrong. It is about what the West can do to make sure that we address the problems of European security jointly. What does that mean? It means engaging in a meaningful dialogue on the architecture of Europe, involving all countries from the Urals across the Atlantic in a dialogue that could result in an agreement that would be binding on all. It means establishing confidence-building measures along NATO's borders with Russia to help reduce the tensions and create an area where we avoid the outbreak of an accidental war. This can be a certain possibility. Ladies and gentlemen, Russia has been a positive partner to the US in the war against terrorism. It has shared crucial intelligence with the United States and with the West on terrorist suspects. It has helped us in the war against Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. It is our partner in climate change negotiations. It has worked with us on the very thorny issue of Iranian nuclear uh, power. It has agreed to reduce its strategic nuclear forces when cooperation was possible. It reduced many of its troops from Kaliningrad when we decided not to deploy our theater missile defense in Europe. It has shown goodwill when we have shown goodwill. It is very important, again, that we build a security that includes Russia. And as Defense, Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger noted, any common security order that excludes Russia would carry with it the seeds of its own destruction. The second uh, remarks there for the motion, Domatila Segromoso, thank you. Now let's move to the second voice against the motion from Warsaw Radek Sikorski, Poland's foreign minister from 2007 to 2014 and previously defense minister from 2005 to 2007, a key architect of the European Union's foreign and security policy. Ladies and gentlemen, Radek Sikorski. The motion says it's time to bring Russia in from the cold. Rapprochement is in the West's best interest. Let's start with from the cold. Yes, I think Russia is in the cold. Um, but is it our fault? I put to you that when the Soviet Union collapsed, we did our utmost to bring Russia in, to make Russia feel comfortable, to join our institutions. We invited Russia to join the Council of Europe. We invited Russia to join WTO. Um, uh, Russia and NATO created a NATO-Russia Council. 
Uh, the European Union started negotiations of a deep and comprehensive free trade area called Partnership and Cooperation uh, Agreement. And it seems to be going well, despite Russia's turn towards autocracy, despite the creation of a kleptocratic system. Uh, and when did it stop? It stopped when Russia proclaimed that she had the right to defend the interests of Russian speakers abroad by military force, and then started doing it. First, doing the Anschluss of Crimea, then using uh, proxy soldiers, so-called little green men, in eastern Ukraine. And why were we so alarmed by this? We were so alarmed by this because we've seen this movie in um, Europe before, and we don't want to see that movie again. Yes, Russia is an important country, and it is in our interest to have uh, good relations. The military power of the United States, the economic power of the European Union, the natural resources of Russia, together we could still set global rules. But we are not together, and I put to you, it's not our fault. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it looked like Russia would finally decolonize itself would finally acquiesce in the captive nations, becoming independent, free, and democratic countries. And to some extent, this is true. I think Russia has given up on Central Europe, but not on the internal empire, the, the former Soviet republics. Russia has also conducted a hybrid war, not just in the former Soviet sphere, also in the West, funding uh, extremist parties of the left and the right, uh, funding a huge cyber operation. We felt it first, some years ago. For a while, Americans wouldn't believe that it could happen to them. Now it has happened to them. This is not acceptable behavior, and therefore we cannot tolerate it. Let us remember that this country, the United States, and Russia were guarantors to Ukraine in 1993, under the Bucharest Memorandum of the independence and sovereignty and the inviolability of borders of Ukraine, in exchange for Ukraine allowing the third largest nuclear arsenal to be dismantled. Um, there are ways that Russia can bring itself back from the cold. The Crimea issue could be to put to a, a, a democratic referendum. The Minsk process could be uh, respected. Russia could restore the control over the international border to the country that uh, has sovereignty over Ukraine. But this is a kleptocratic regime, uh, less genocidal than some of the previous ones. These are thieves, not mass murderers. They kill retail, not wholesale. That's, pro <laughs> That's progress. Of course Russia is part of Europe, but so was Germany. Engage? Yes, but don't turn a blind eye. Um, when treaties are broken uh, or abrogated, a bad thing. I, ABM was probably our mistake, but, uh, but INF uh, breach is Russia's mistake. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's in our interest to have a working relation with an important country such as Russia. Yes, Russia is in the cold. Uh, uh, and we should bring her back, but it is up to Russia for us to be able to judge when the time is ripe. Thank you. Radek Sikorsky, the second speaker against the motion. Now, let me ask the, those with microphones to begin moving around, please. But before I come to the audience, let me tell you how you were thinking when you came into this hall about an hour ago. 40% um, of you had not decided. For the motion, 36%, 24% against the motion. So you've got a bit of work to do here on my left general and former minister. I don't know which way it's going to go um, in the coming period. Now, let's get as many voices as possible from over here. Hello. And you uh, are from? I am from Siberia, Russia. I am for, the, for bringing Russia back from the cold. Yeah, all for it. 
Your uh, question. Yes, my question is, uh, how exactly uh, do you think should this bringing from the cold happen? I mean, for example, Crimea. Uh, I myself is Crimean Tatar, so and have many relatives in Crimea. So uh, you mentioned quickly that Russia should hold a democratic referendum again. But what if Crimeans once again vote to stay with Russia? Do you then agree with the annexation? And presumably coming from Siberia, you do have a problem with that phrase coming in from the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Hayes. Yeah, very, very, very briefly, uh, as an American, I, I certainly understand the concept of popular sovereignty and, and the will of the people. But as Radek pointed out, you know, changing lines in Europe by force, even if they are passingly popular, is a very, very dangerous precedent to set. And would, would the Russian Federation welcome uh, similar uh, plebiscites in Chechnya or in Chechnya and, and to let the will of the people determine whether they are or not part of the Russian Federation. I think they take the other side of the argument. Right, let's keep answers short and questions short, please. Who's at the back? I'm pro the Russian people, their people, but how can Western leaders justify bringing into the cold a government that has recently repeatedly vetoed a UN resolution um, to condemn the chemical attacks in Syria? Vladimir Posner. I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. Are there things that Russia has done wrong? Of course there are. There are many things that they've done wrong. The issue is, is it or is it not in the interests of the West, of the United States, and of the world to rather engage <clears throat> Russia than to push it away and let things happen inside the way they will happen? That's my only question. I'm not here to defend Russia. I'm not here to defend Putin. I'm asking, is it in our interest to make this happen, or is it not? And my answer is yes. And there are many things that I don't like about what's going on in Russia. Not only in Russia, but in Russia as well. Right, I'm going to take three questions, please. But, Who's... Oh, but wait, the, the, uh, Russia is not isolated. We talk okay. to Russia all the time. But President Putin wasn't just in Paris. He comes to international uh, uh, meetings, he makes agreements, uh, but then he just doesn't do what he promises no, to no, do, like, like, uh, as, in, as in Ukraine. So, we have sanctions on Russia because of what Russia did. Okay, so don't say it's not being isolated. It is. It's being pushed away out of G7, or rather out of GH, out of the European Assembly. It is. Let's face it. Let's be honest about this. This statement may cut both ways. But the Russian Federation has already changed borders by force. They've already used military force to occupy other neighbors' territories, and they have already interfered with other nations' elections. Thank you. Please, further back. I, w I came in undecided. I think I'm against. Question for Domitila. You said that uh, Russia does not have it in its DNA to be a totalitarian state. I find that extraordinary. Can you just expand on that? Because in the whole of Western society, I can't think of another state that is more totalitarian. And surely the risk of doing this, bringing them in, is old dogs, new tricks, and it's more like an old wolf that's going to turn around and bite us. And uh, is there a lady down here? No. Gentleman. Yes, I am for the motion. But my question is, if Russia accepts that their neighbors are sovereign states, how can they oppose the um, self-determination of their neighbors to join NATO if they see it's in their own self-defense interests. Thank you. Uh, Very good question. Uh, and the point is that there is a framework that Donatella proposes in which Russia is a respected member. It's called the OSCE, as you know, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which whose Russia principles turn, Russia has flagrantly violated. Russia wanted to turn the OSCE into the security architecture of Europe, and we disagreed. And may I say that I explained in my opening statement the many efforts of many Russians to bring down the most totalitarian system that had existed in the USSR. So to argue that Russians are genetically totalitarian... Yeah, but those good Russians are not in power in Russia. They were in power for... I'd like to make a point here. The idea that some nation is genetically somehow not up to par to me, smells of fascism. I'd be very careful.
If Russia defines acceptable security as controlling the behavior of its near neighbors in terms of what its near neighbors consider to be its go their government, their policies, and their relationships, that simply can't stand. Right. Let me get some more. There are an enormous number of hands. Be patient. There's a voice there uh, with a microphone. What are you for or against the motion? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Georgia, and for the moment, I'm against. And I have the question. Like, we here talked quite a lot about fears of Russia. But what about us? We have fears also, Georgians, Ukrainians. That's the question. And like, if you will have positive agenda, positive agenda, nobody will run far from Russia. Be democratic, economically attractive. That's the solution. Let, let me put that to you immediately, uh, Donatella, but particularly because part of Georgia is still held, Abkhazia, by Russian forces. Because security is indivisible. You cannot build your security at the expense of someone else's insecurity. And Georgia borders the most sensitive border of Russia, which is the North Caucasus, and is facing a very vibrant Islamist insurgency. I am not arguing in favor of Russia's occupation of Georgia. I'm making it very clear that there are conditions that must be set in our dialogue with Russia. I'm just arguing that we need to build an inclusive security system in Europe. This country, last I look, has 250 tanks. France, 250 tanks. Germany, 250 tanks. Russia, 5,000. So? So don't tell me that we are about to invade Russia. Nobody, you know, nobody has said that you're about to invade Russia, and it's not about tanks, ladies and gentlemen. It's about missiles, and it's mainly American missiles. It's not Polish missiles, or Czech missiles, or Romanian, heaven forbid. Well, you now missiles. have your own so, American president. So, Why didn't, don't you tell as, him what to do? And as George Kennan. Please, at the back. I'd like to ask the panel, is the threat of Russia massively exaggerated by the EU, by, military, by the military in the West, by NATO sustain its position? As I understand it, the Russian economy is smaller than Italy. Their defense expenditure is less than the United Kingdom. So is there really a military threat? Down here, the lady, please. Can you explain why there is no freedom of speech or expression in, the, in, the, in Russia? And I think there this is. could be the stumbling block. There is. All right, thank you. Please, at the back. There is. Hello, I'm for the motion. Um, people keep saying that Russia are meddling in the uh, elections, but actually the CIA secretly sent money across um, after the Second World War to fund a European movement. So that's meddling with things. Thank you. Now, as a former uh, head of the CIA and the NSA, can I just pick up that point over there? Given what's, being, what's happening in Congress at the moment in the US, does the CIA meddle in political processes anywhere in the world? There is, there's a, uh, <laughs> there is a history. You're, 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 you're not in office at the moment, there Mike is, Hayden. There is an acknowledged history of, of my agency trying to level the playing field in Europe after World War II with what mass communist movements. But let me offer the view that the color revolutions and what happened in the Maidan in Kiev were spontaneous combustion. They were not engineered by Western intelligence services. Uh, uh, Vladimir Posner, there was a question there about freedom of speech. You're a, you have your own television program. Do you feel constrained as a television presenter? Are there, are there mind walls which mean that you can't do certain things as a senior commentator and analyst in uh, Russia? There are certain, certain things that Channel One, which buys my show, will not accept. And I know this. So you don't have freedom of speech? I've been around the block a couple of times. I am known to be not a supporter of Putin in Russia. I work my, my show is on Channel One, which is controlled by the government. And I can pretty much say what I want with some limitations. There are anti-Putin newspapers, anti-Putin radio shows. Before you say that there is no freedom of speech in Russia, go there, listen, talk to people. It's not the kind of freedom of speech I would like to see. It's much less. But to say that it doesn't exist, this is not China. Believe me, it's a very different country. Now, let's... Nick, 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 Nick. Even, even in communist Poland, we had freedom of speech. What we had trouble with was freedom after the speech.
But I want to get back to that other point up there about exaggeration of the military threat. Yeah. Look, the, the Soviets, and I, I actually meant Soviets, all right, it's not a senior moment. The Soviets were famous for what they called the correlation of forces. And it is an approach to war fighting that the Russian armed forces have inherited. It is a very scientific, very fact-based approach to who holds military advantage. There is no conceivable way that Russian officers schooled in that methodology could view the current NATO deployments and, frankly, the entire NATO military infrastructure as representing any kind of serious threat to the defense of the Russian Federation. Right. Let me get some more questions, please. Yeah, but, Who's uh, let me just remind you that Russia lost 27 million people as a result of that. And you say nothing to fear. Every Russian remembers what that was about. Let me go to four more microphones, please. No, no, no. I've got to jump. I got, I got, okay. okay. i got to comment. You cannot justify policy based upon the mythology of the past. It's the deaths, were, the deaths were real. It is not the deaths pathology. were real, but there is no equivalency between that Soviet nightmare and the reality we have in Europe today. And if you allow them to justify today's policy based upon that history, they're never coming in. General, it is not. And also, they were not Russian. They were peoples of the Soviet Union, many of whom you killed in, in your own gulag I mean, during I the war. I didn't kill anybody, you know, not yet. Uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, right. I, I might at the end of this show, you know, I might. <laughs> uh, but, just, but, but just Vladimir, me. Vladimir, I have to get you to the end of the show, so let's just have some order, please. Up there. I'm uh, for the motion. Uh, my question is for those who are debating against. Uh, what positive purpose do you think keeping Russia in the cold at the moment serves? Because we seem to have sanctions and have frozen them out of the G8, and it, as far as I can tell, it's making things worse. It's led to things we're talking about in Crimea and Ukraine. It just seems to have inflamed conflict. And that suggests what Vladimir was saying earlier is, is right. All right, 30 seconds each, please. There, please. I think the people hostile to the motion are being a little bit precious about some of the criteria they're setting up. Uh, if you were a country on the border of Russia, you're just going to have to lump it. My question is, if we did take steps to let people in from the cold, would the two people who are proposing the motion tell us how they think Russia would react? What positive things might happen if we did do the various things we ought to do? All right, what thank do you, you think Russia would do? Thank you. Right, who's got the microphone here? I am from Ukraine. We do not have any limitation of freedom of speech. Most certainly if you say that Russia has no limitation of freedom of speech. Then, right. as for uh, today and the issue at stake, whether Russia should be brought in from the cold. Does Russia want to be brought in from the cold? If you are so scared of the West, then maybe it's best to deal with this fear at first, to seek assistance for it through your own means, but not to act upon it. Thank you. Please. Um, aren't we actually, in a way, missing the whole point? And Russia's a very easy to enemy to have. Lots of missiles, lots of tanks, lots of soldiers, and their little red telephone on a desk in each end of the Atlantic. If we'd be focused on Islam, Russia is supporting the anti-Wahhabist movement that's funded by countries that aren't Russian, and they're the ones blowing people up on the streets of London. Right, thank you. Uh, first of all, that point to both of you uh, who are against the motion that you're being rather precious. Oh. The, Do you feel um, precious? Uh, I don't know about that, but... Uh, the point is that at uh, the Bucharest uh, NATO summit, we did not offer either Georgia or Ukraine a membership action plan, and President Putin nevertheless did what he threatened to do, which is to take Georgian territory and then take Ukrainian territory. Free trade, which is essentially what we have between um, the European Union and Ukraine, without any promise of membership, does not threaten anybody. It was Russia that moved the goalposts because Russia now wants to create an alternative pole of integration with herself at its lead. We, the Europeans, should be disintegrated. Russia can augment its strength. Right, it makes you. sense, uh, but it is, it is a different conception 
uh, from what Russia had done. Right, uh, thank you for the moment. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. We, we talked about how do, you, how do you do this? How do you approach it? If you were going to approach uh, the Russians, how do you get to a better place? I can, I can give you the historical account of two successive American administrations whose Russian reset policy is a mass pile of rubble. We've had two administrations expending tremendous domestic political capital to reset American relationships with the Russian Federation, and they both ended in disaster when the Russian army crossed what the rest of us thought was an international border. All right, please, down here, the lady here. Uh, hello, I'm for the motion, and the historical precedent has been exercised here when the successful alliance has been brought between Churchill and Stalin at the extreme circumstances. So my question is, are the extreme circumstances today not enough with the terrorism? Thank you. I'm against the motion. Um, Donna Tiller says we need to ask ourselves how we got to where we are. And I agree, introspection is always a good thing. I see no sign of that coming out of Moscow. Where, where are the people saying, why are all our neighbors moving away from us? Or why are they desperately trying to move away from us? Even Belarus. And as far as they're concerned, it's not that NATO is going up to the Russian border. They're trying to get away from you. They're moving westwards. I think that this is not entirely true. I think there has been a lot of effort by many of these countries and peoples and companies within these countries to develop close economic ties with Russia. You find that in Belarus, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan. This is not true. And what is also important to note, and this is what we are standing for, we are not giving Russia a blank check. We are talking about engaging in a dialogue that reduces tensions so that we can address key issues of security in Europe and globally together. And there are many instances, contrary to what was said on the other side of the aisle, where Russia and the United States have worked corporately. And Vladimir Putin in the early 2000s offered help towards the West in its war against terrorism. Thank you. The lady there, please. How is Russia pursued uh, now? as an old proven enemy or as a ca caricaturistic uh, villain? What is the balance? Let me ask you that there, uh, Michael Hayden and uh, Radek Sikorsky, on that issue of the caricature, the, the characterization, I should say. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be very efficient here because that's a very important question. Uh, I was director of CIA for three years, the last three years of the Bush administration, and I will admit a failing that I didn't pay enough attention to Russia at that time, contrary to the Russian expectation, the Russian folklore that I was spending every waking moment making life worse for Vladimir Putin. The current vision we have of the Russian Federation is a very precarious leader, despite the opinion polls, who is trying to look for legitimacy for what is fundamentally a very difficult political domestic situation. Term one, Putin won. I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry. I'm going to make you rich. Oil is over $110 a barrel. Now oil is floating at less than half that price. And Putin, as a means of self-justification, is I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry about it. I'm going to make you proud because these people are real dangers, and I'm going to defend you against them. I do think the engine behind an awful lot of Russian activity that we view to be dangerous is a domestic political engine for domestic survival for the president. Thank you. Right. The gentleman there. Uh, when George W. Bush first met Vladimir Putin, uh, with the words that he subsequently regretted, he claimed to have looked into his eyes and got a measure of his soul. What do you think? Donald Trump will see when he looks into <laughs> Vladimir Putin's eyes, probably in July when they meet at the G20, and what conclusions do you think he will draw? Michael Hayden, I have to ask you, did you examine Vladimir Putin's eyes? <laughs> did you not, understand? Not, not personally. Um, let me give you another American experience uh, along those lines. This is Bob Gates, uh, former DCI before he became Secretary of Defense, so I actually was in Bob's office. He then came back and reported to, to President Bush, I looked Mr. Putin in the eye, and I saw the KGB. <laughs> that is very revealing. We have a man whose world view was shaped by service in an intelligence service with, with, with an 
incredibly conspiratorial view of the world. That's an incredible well, argument. It plus, really is. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> plus, plus, plus wait, wait, wait a minute, Brett This is a man who on 9-11 called the United States, offered help, and offered a helping hand, and offered the desire of Russia to become a member of NATO. This was a man who understood what the real challenges were. It is not a threat of Russia that we are facing. It is a threat of Islamist radical jihadism. Is terrorism the kind of extreme circumstance in which we have to essentially um, forget about other countries' internal arrangements and make alliances with them anyway? Uh, with respect, because I know what's just happened in London, I was actually a white eyewitness to the previous attack on, on Westminster Bridge, terrorism is not an existential threat to our way of life. It's nasty, but it cannot bring us down. Right, I now have the debate result, and let me remind you um, that uh, when you came in here, 40% of you uh, did not have any idea which way you wanted to vote. 24% were on that side of the House uh, against the motion, and 36% were on that side of the House. Now listen carefully and precisely to what I'm about to tell you. 5% are undecided now, so you've all shifted, almost all of you, against 47% for 48%. So the, uh, those speaking against the motion have persuaded more of you to swing dramatically, but ultimately uh, the floor was won by the proposers uh, for the motion that it's time to bring Russia in from the cold. Can I thank you all very much indeed? The speakers, all of you, and uh, from me, Nick Gowing, here in the Emanuel Centre, on behalf of the BBC and Intelligence Squared, thank you very much indeed, and congratulations to the speakers.